I begin? Uh, once again, welcome, Your Excellencies. Uh, recognize the Ambassador of Argentina and, of course, the Ambassador of El Salvador, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, public forum run by the Australian National Centre of Latin American Studies, the Embassy of El Salvador in Australia and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And we have, uh, as you know, two speakers, distinguished speakers today. The first is the Ambassador of the Republic of El Salvador, uh, His Excellency uh, Manuel Gutierrez Ruiz, and this is his first uh, speaking role, I think, at the ANU. And in fact, thinking back, I think it's pro probably the first meeting that we've had at the ANU, specifically about El Salvador, certainly in my time. So in a, a short time already, uh, we've started to become interlinked and involved with, with El Salvadorian affairs here at the ANU. We also have uh, Rowena uh, Thompson, who is the Director of the Canada, Mexico, Central America and Caribbean section, Canada and Latin American branch of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, who will be speaking second. And then there'll be time for discussion and then for more informal discussion afterwards with refreshments. I'd like to just say a few words about the topic of the, the talks the, this afternoon, the current state of the Central America integration system achievements and challenges. As uh, someone who teaches in international relations and international political economy, the, the question of regional integration and regional organisation has become over the last few years a hot topic in international relations in, uh, and in international economics, in fact. And thinking about why that is the case, I think that since the 1990s, one of the most commonly used terms really in the lexicon of people studying searching international relations has been the term globalisation. It's often, I think, been overused, uh, it's often been exaggerated, but many of the processes which people talk about when they, when they mention the term globalisation, that is increased cross-border trade, increased cross-border investment, and processes of increasingly people moving across borders, questions of transnational crime, and many other issues that are associated with this broad and sometimes fuzzy notion of globalisation have, I think, brought the question of regional integration into focus because on the one hand, it seems to me that the old bilateral ways of states doing business with each other have been to a certain extent superseded by that, those processes, those globalising processes or made more difficult to be carried out solely with bilateral relations between nation states. But on the other hand, I think some of the uh, exaggerations amongst theorists of globalisation have suggested that the nation state is in a process of irreversible decline, that national sovereignty and national territories will inevitably disappear. Some of those exaggerations have simply not come to pass either. And the nation state still is, it seems to me, the major player in international relations. And as a result, I think, regional organisation has come to fill some of the gap an organisation, multilateral organisations between nation states negotiating, negotiating about these processes that have taken place over the last few decades at least. And the multilateral organisations at a higher level have not always been adequate to respond to those challenges. Things like the United Nations, Security Council, reform has not happened, is not really on the agenda and even organisations, broader multilateral organisations like the World Trade Organisation, which have really been incapable of dealing with some of the challenges, agriculture for example in the case of the WTO. And Latin America has been one of the places in which regional organisations have sprouted uh, enormously over the last two to three decades. So of course we have Mercosur, we have CELAC, we have UNASUR, we have ALBA and so on. And now as well CETA. The Central American integration process. So I think it's going to be a stimulating discussion which is at a, a very important time in discussion of regional organisation, not only in Latin America but in other parts of the world as well. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, His Excellency Manuel Gutierrez Ruiz, who has been Ambassador of the Republic of El Salvador in Australia just since the 26th of June in 2013, but he has a very long uh, CV of distinguished positions in diplomacy from 2011 to 2012. He was the National Executive Director of the Mesoamerican Program from 1996 to 98. He was Ambassador of El Salvador in the UK 
From 1977 to 79, he was chargé d'affaires in the Embassy of El Salvador in France, 76 to 77, General Consul in Germany, and holding many other positions in international diplomacy and at home in El Salvador as well. So please join me in welcoming His Excellency Manuel Gutierrez Ruiz. Thank you. Thank you all. Welcome. Welcome the whole Latin America community linked with ANCLAS. John Mins, Director for Australia National Center for Latin American Studies. Rovina Thompson, Director of Canada, Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, and the DFAT. Dear Colegio of the Diplomatic Corps, Ambassador Pedro Viagra, the Canada Corpo Diplomatico, and dear Ambassador from Peru. Professors and students of the Austrian National University, dear friends from the Salvador Comunidad Salvadoreña in Australia, Comunidad Latinoamericana. It's a great honor for me to be here this afternoon to share with all of you about the Central American integration process in the context of the commemoration of the Day of the Central American Integration. Thank very much for all the people that have worked to make this lecture possible. Today, we will analyze the current state of the Central American integration systems, its main challenges, the perspective of the Salvadorian government on regional integration, and the relation between Australia and Central America. Let me tell you before to begin with the presentation that every 14th of October, all the Central American countries commemorate the day of the integration, remembering that it was on the 14th of October 1960, when the Central American countries signed the San Salvador Charter through with the Organización de los Estados Centroamericanos, ODECA was known, was established then. ODECA was in the process that preceded the SICA attempt, and that's why we celebrate the date of the creation in that time. This is Central America at a glance. We have a total area of about half a million square kilometers, a population of almost 43 million, which is about the size of Peru, a growth disposal of a product of $279 billion, and a per capita income of 6,533. This is the average inflation rates, the currencies, and the time zones. The history. The integration has its origins in the history of the Central American people after the process of independence and the constitution of the United Provinces of Central America in 1821, through which the five countries of the region joined in the spirit of integrating region and worked together to achieve common interests. Nevertheless, the first attempt concluded in the establishment of independent states. Subsequently, there were other integration attempts which, like the first, failed to help to the creation of the ODECA in the 50s. The most recent commitment with regional integration was reaffirmed in 1991 when Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama agreed to the creation of the Central American Integration Systems, SICA, as the regional, legal, and institutional framework aimed to constitute Central America as a region of peace, freedom, democracy, and development. The objectives of SICA, to consolidate the democracy and strengthen its institution on the basis of the existence of government elected by universal, free, and secret vote and full respect for human rights, creating a new model of regional security based on a reasonable balance of forces, the strengthening of civilian power, overcoming extreme poverty, promoting sustainable development, environmental protection, eradication of violence, corruption, terrorism, drug trafficking, and arms trafficking. Promote a comprehensive system of freedom to ensure the full and harmonious development of the individual and society as a whole. Achieve a regional welfare system and economic and social justice for the people of Central America. Achieve an economic union and strengthen the Central America financial system in order to strengthen the region as an economic <coughs> bloc 
to insert successfully into the international economy, promote a harmonious and balanced sustained economic, social, and cultural and political development on the member states of the region as a whole. The Central American integration systems formed by four member states, the founding member states in the regional America and the Central American region, the regional observers in the Americas, and the extra regional observers, of which Australia is, is one of them. Australia became member in 2011, during the visit of former Prime Minister Kevin Rowe to El Salvador. The regional institutions that composes the main work, the framework of the, of the SICA systems, the, CIS, the main bodies are the Central American President's Meeting, the Central American Council of Ministers, the Executive Committee, the CERB, Central American General Secretariat that as of last month has a new General Secretary in the person of former Foreign Affairs Minister of El Salvador, Mr. Hugo Martinez. The auxiliary bodies are the Central American Vice President Vice President meetings, the Central American Parliament, the Central American Court of Justice, the Central American Advisory Committee for the civil, we play an a important role with the civil society. The system Secretariats, the Central American Economic Integration System, CIECA, the Environmental Executive Secretariat, the Central American Cultural General Secretariat, with a, a, a total number of, 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 ten, of 10 similar bodies. The specialized institutions, the Central American Integration Bank, which together with IDB form the main, the main partners and donors to the regional Central American process. The Central American Maritime Transportation Committee, COCATRAM. The Central American University Council with 25 specialized institutions. The Central America Integration System is a truly multidimensional one. The economic integration subsystems grafted on the Protocol of Guatemala of 93, the political integration subsystems grafted by the Protocol of Tegucigalpa of 91, the integration economic environmental subsystem drafted by the Alliance of 94, the citizens security integration, the democratic security framework treaty of 95, and the social integration subsystem drafted in the Social Integration Accord of 95. In 2010, El Salvador relaunched the initiative to move forward ahead with the SICA systems in five large areas. Democratic security, climate change and risk reduction, social integration, economical integration, and institutional strengthening. The Central American Integration System, Citizen Security. Central America has defined the Central America Security Strategy, ESCA, in the context of the Central American Democratic Security Treaty. ESCA is now integrated for 22 regional projects, 16 of which have been executed and the remaining balance will be developed in the midterm. Additionally, Central America will review and update a legal instrument according to the new realities and regional security scenarios. In the same way, Central America seeks to harmonize the criminal legislation and gas organized crime in Central America and the Dominican Republic. Central America integration system, climate change, and risk reduction. SICA has a regionally integral management policy for disaster risk. Central America is working in the definition of a new program to promote renewable energy and energy efficiency. 
SICA is also working in the regional strategy for efficient lighting. SICA is developing a coordinated roadmap for the member states. SICA is implementing the Central America Action Plan for Agricultural Policy. The Central America Social Integration within SICA. The work of SICA is the pillar of social integration, is based in the axis of social three dimension, work, medicine, social agenda, HIV, gender, and culture. The main objectives are the reduction of social gaps, promoting social inclusion, regulation of integrated labor markets, and reforming and strengthening the social subsistence, as well as the strengthening of the Council of Ministers of the Labor of Central American Dominican Republic. The deepening of the social agenda following the opening of the Secretariat for Social Integration, SICA in Panama, the sustainability a response to HIV, the promotion of a regional policy of equality and equity gender, as well as the implementation of the Central American Integration Cultural Policy. The economic integration within SICA, negotiations under the protocol of incorporation of Panama to Central America the economic system have, have been fully realized. The establishment of the Customs Union, of which 97% is harmonized, and the promotion of interregional trade. Promotion of regional actions for the implementation of the association agreement between Central America and of Europe, which finally was signed for all member countries two weeks ago. Implementation of the regional strategy for the promotion of entrepreneurship, the creation of regional model for quality and sustainable tourism. Strengthening the institutional framework within SICA. SICA institutional reforms in order to give greater efficiency, transparency, and equitable geographical representation. SICA is supporting the Dominican Republic to its full integration as a member of the state of SICA, which is in the last stage. Greater articulation and coordination between the secretariats of the system. Implementation of an effective management mechanism of regional cooperation, as well as the organization and development of different forums for dialogue and cooperation with their countries. Execution of projects submitted by civil society. El Salvador in SICA. El Salvador became a member of SICA since its very beginning in 1991. Salvador participates in all the regional subsystems and all the SICA regional institutions. El Salvador believes that integration is a positive instrument for development and a fundamental instrument to promote an adequate regional insertion in the international markets. In 2010, as shown a presentation a while ago, El Salvador, pro tempore presidency and SICA, relaunch and updating of the SICA priorities. The Central American Integration System challenges consolidate the custom union, the strengthening of the institutional framework from a coordinated levels to supranational levels, generation of regional growing and development through the integration, execution of the regional agenda in economic, migratory, security, and environmental fields. That will be all. With this bird's eye view, I have tried to convey where Central America integration system is now in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I'd now like to, or first I'd like to uh, recognize the ambassadors as well of Peru and of Ecuador, I missed earlier. Uh, the next speaker is Rowena, Rowena Thompson from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I won't attempt to read out the very, the branch of DFAT once again. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. We don't often get a chance to talk about Australia's relations with Central America. and. Um, 
I'd like to thank the Ambassador for his um, excellent presentation. It was actually very helpful for us um, and updated us on our understanding about Seeker's work at the moment. Um, I'd also, um, before I start, like to thank um, John Minns and UNCLASS for putting on this seminar. I'd like to um, uh, thank the ambassadors from other Latin American countries here for coming. We really appreciate it. And uh, I'd just like to say that um, in uh, having to think about Australia's relations with Central America, and in particular SICA, it, it made me pause because um, it's been very easy to think about the, the distance that has separated us over the years. And it's taken the form of geography, we're very far apart. It's also taken the form of um, different spheres of influence. Uh, we've been part of the British colonial system, Central American countries have been part of the Spanish colonial system. And when I was um, doing some research about the connections between Australia and Central America, um, I was not surprised to find there's not a lot of stuff on, you know, for instance, the, the internet about connections. <laughs> but, but I was quite surprised to find that there was a moment in history when we might have become a Spanish colony. Uh, and so I just thought I'd share that with you. I mean, you. Some of you may know about it, but I had not known about it. Um, I'm assuming I just click to the right. This was the journey of uh, a Spanish explorer, Luis Vallez de Torres. In 1606, he was on a mission from the Spanish crown to find the southern land of Terra Australis. And he missed, if only he'd gone a little bit further south. He went across the top of Australia, and thus we have the Torres Strait. It was named after him. And there is even speculation that he may have seen the tip of Australia, but didn't know it. Uh, so he went on to have some great adventures. Um, he ran into a few problems, it didn't go too well. Uh, but the stories of his uh, travels um, subsequently came to the attention of the British, which then informed the travels of James Cook, who had a much better luck in locating Terra Australis. Um, but I, I found an interesting thing in all of this was I had always known that um, James Cook had stopped in at Rio de Janeiro on the way through a uh, Portuguese port. Um, at this stage, 200 years later, they weren't keen to see him. They forbade his ship from disembarking. They didn't trust the British and they had to sneak off in the, you know, darkness of night and steal a few plants and then continue on their way. Um, but um, the, and I then looked at what happened with the first um, fleet um, routes coming out to Australia, the first fleet, the second fleet, the third fleet. Did any of them go near Central America? And they didn't. It was, you know, coming from Britain straight down either around Cape Horn or around the bottom of South America to get to Australia. So Central America was not on the way to anywhere between Australia and the UK at that stage. And uh, I think Things, I don't think things really significantly changed until the Panama Canal opened up, which was a very significant shift in the geography of the globe and how we were then able to engage with Central America. And I um, came across a um, map recently. It's quite a recent map. Um, it was tweeted by Bill Gates. I've become a Twitter fan. And uh, I just thought it was a very interesting picture, which is, uh, this was only put up in the last month, the um, density of commercial shipping routes. And you can see the, um, the traffic that goes through the Panama Canal, for instance. And so that's, of course, been there for 100 years. And I found that, um, you know, in the early, you know, around the First World War and the Second World War, um, on the Australian War Memorial site, for instance, there's um, the registry of war graves where people have um, died in, the Pan in Panama during those periods and have been buried in the um, war cemetery in Panama. So I think that's, um, in this last century, we've seen, you know, a lot more contact between Australia and Central America. But it's, um, I would, we would still have to say that um, relations are a modest level of relations between Central America. It's still not that convenient to get to Central America. We still have to, you know, 
fly north or fly south and then come into Central America. But it was fun, fun finding out about the Torres Strait. Um, I would say that um, in, with regard to the Central American Integration System, which we're, we commonly use the acronym SICA, S-I-C-A, um, I think to understand our relations with um, SICA, it's helpful to understand the nature of our relations with Central America. And I would say that we have, you know, typically several different planks of relations. There's the work we do multilaterally, there's the engagement we have regionally, particularly through SICA, and I'll come to that at the end. And there's also bilateral relations. And I was struck by John's comment that despite um, the proliferation of regional institutions to support relations, bilateral relations are still a very important foundation for international relations. And that's still the case for us today with Central America. So I think multilaterally, we, we share a lot of interests with Central American countries. Uh, and our interests intersect on issues such as environment, climate change, whaling issues, fisheries management, human rights and security. And we collaborate, in different ways we collaborate with um, Central American countries in the UN. Um, some recent examples include, we've just recently concluded the negotiation of an arms trade treaty. And Costa Rica was one of the co-authors with Australia and some other countries. Um, but we saw you know, Costa Rica's role as representing also the interests of Central American countries. And we were very pleased to see those negotiations conclude in June. Costa Rica and Australia were some of the first countries to sign. We've also since then seen El Salvador and Guatemala sign the arms trade treaty. Um, there's over 100 countries now have signed that treaty. Um, other examples of collaboration in the United Nations include um, we are currently on the United Nations Security Council with Guatemala. Um, for this year, we, our work is um, overlapping in the UN Security Council. And apart from the work we do on the Security Council together, um, we collaborated earlier this year with Guatemala to host a conference which was focusing on perspectives from the field, from uh, gender practitioners in peacekeeping operations about um, the work on gender issues which would support UN work on women, peace and security. And that was a very successful uh, collaboration which involved um, ministers from both sides, I think. Um, an interesting feature, I might just pull up, I think the next one is a map. I might just pull this up. Just, um, it took me a while to get across um, the countries um, and I, unfortunately they're not labelled here. but. Um, one of the members of SICA, of Central America, is also a Caribbean state, which, and I'll just point it out for those of you who might know it, which is Belize. It sits across here. And they are also members of the Caribbean community. And, and they've um, said to me on occasions they see themselves as being a bridge between the Caribbean region and the Central American region. And uh, one of the issues Australia is, has been working on closely with Belize is the International Coral Reef Initiative. And next week in Belize, Belize will host the next meeting of the International Coral Reef Initiative. Uh, this is looking at work to preserve coral reefs and related ecosystems through the protection and rational use of oceans, seas and coastal areas. Um, Belize has, I think, the third largest coral reef system. Australia has the largest coral reef system. Um, and that's a very natural point of collaboration for us. And also in supporting the, um, the uh, oceans issues in the, in the Central American and Caribbean region. We also, of course, collaborate with Central American countries in um, various other forums. And uh, there's one forum which actually brings together Latin American countries, not only Central America, but Latin American countries and Asian countries. It's called the Forum for East Asia Latin America Cooperation. Um, it looks at increasing and improving mutual understanding, trust and political dialogue and cooperation across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Costa Rica is going to host that meeting next in 2015. And if you um, have any questions about the work of Fair like my colleague, Richard Newman went to the last Fairlake meeting in Bali. 
we work closely with some Central American countries, or actually with all Central American countries in different ways, in the World Trade Organization, for instance. Uh, but uh, two countries, uh, Costa Rica and Guatemala, for instance, are also members of the CANS group with Australia, which seeks to promote reform of agricultural trade, global agricultural trade. Uh, we work with um, most Central American countries and Australia are also observers to um, a newly formed Latin American group called the Pacific Alliance, which is uh, Mexico, Colombia, Peru and Chile, which is focused on uh, trade liberalisation on the Pacific coast of uh, Latin America. And, you know, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Panama, the Dominican Republic and Australia are all observers to the work that's going on there. Costa Rica is to become a member of the Pacific Alliance. Um, Panama also hopes to become a member next year of the Pacific Alliance. So our interests intersect there and we uh, collaborate closely on those issues. Uh, and then I think um, bilaterally, on the trade investment front for instance, we have modest trade investment relations. They've been growing over recent years. So, for instance, um, the development of Panama as a regional hub, which has been going on for 100 years, um, you know, provides um, a very impressive hub for shipping, finance and air transport. Um, it also, unfortunately, provides a very useful hub for um, organised criminal gangs and um, the shipment of drugs. Um, so that leads to another form of collaboration with Central America, particularly in the Panama region, which is on dealing with transnational organised crime. Uh, we have um, the global mining boom in, in recent years has um, seen Australian engagement across the whole globe, um, including in uh, Central America. For instance, we have, um, we're the second largest mining investor in the Dominican Republic. And um, there's an Australian linkage to, in Panama, to the Cobra Panama mine, which is the largest copper mine in the world. Um, but also Australians um, spread themselves far and wide. And I've heard, for instance, of um, an Australian entrepreneur who has been living in, in Nicaragua. Um, he established a business employing local Nicaraguans to um, process naturally felled timber uh, and to, for export to Taiwan. So it's surprising where Australians go and what they do. Um, over the past few years, we've had, um, we've expanded our diplomatic relations across Central America. It's taken um, a couple of different forms. One is we've become an observer to the Central American integration system, to SICA. Uh, but another is we have, over the last few years, to open up honorary consulates uh, throughout uh, Central American countries, um, including El Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua and Panama. I'm not certain if you're all familiar with the role of an honorary consulate, but they they offer um, support on consular issues for Australians who may have problems when they're travelling through the region, for instance. Um, they can be helpful um, in uh, connecting um, Australians to local communities. Uh, so we see them as an extension of our embassy, which for uh, Central America, our embassy is based in Mexico. Uh, and I think... Um, one of the most significant developments in bilateral relations, diplomatic relations in recent years, has been the opening by El Salvador of an embassy in Australia last year. It's the first Central American embassy to be in Australia. Uh, we hope there will be some more in the future. Uh, it was also um, a very nice alignment um, this year. Ambassador Gutierrez became the 100th ambassador during the centenary year of Canberra the 100th ambassador resident in Australia. Um, and uh, so that was a very nice moment. We, um, and I think in terms of relations, you know, our cooperation at the multilateral level, bilateral relations, but also um, at the bilateral level, there's just the connection between people. And we've been separated by geography, great distance over the years, but Australians do like to travel, they go far and wide, and um, 
there was one Australian in, uh, in 2010 who ran from pole to pole, from the North Pole to the South Pole to raise funding for the Red Cross. Um, his route took him down the whole length of the Americas, including through Central America. And he raised $100,000 towards um, bringing clean water to developing communities around the world. Uh, and I think um, at the time he, was, he made quite a splash as he ran through some of the less secure areas of Central America. Um, but we also, these days we're finding other travellers going to Central America include surfers. Apparently there's some very good beaches in Central America. And with regard to Central Americans living in Australia, um, there's a very interesting story about El Salvador, which many of you may know, and some of you are from El Salvador and have lived this experience. Um, but back in 1983, during El Salvador's civil war, 75 El Salvadorans arrived in Australia under our special humanitarian program. They were resettled here at the time at the request of the El Salvador government. Uh, over the following three years, another 10,000 Salvadorans arrived in Australia under the same program. Uh, many of these were refugees who'd been living in third countries, such as Costa Rica and Mexico. Uh, in the last national census done in Australia in 2011, uh, they listed over 9,500 people indicated that they were from El Salvador by birth. Uh, and if you take into account the number of children who have been born to El Salvadorans, then you, would, you could say that there's a community of about 20,000 El Salvadorans in Australia. Um, it's the second largest Latin American community in Australia. And they can now, Salvadorans can now be found in all walks of life including civil service and the arts. We have um, uh, come across El Salvadorans in all walks of life. Um, we even have an actor of Salvadoran descent now, um, a young man called Mauricio Marino Jr., who is a star of The Neighbours television program. So, um, and I think um, over recent years, as when you see these communities develop, with that comes the establishment of stronger relations. So for instance, the opening of an embassy in Australia. Um, in recent years, we've also had ministerial visits coming both ways. Um, it's been a very um, positive development. And I think that leaves then Australia's relationship with the regional institution of Central America. Um, we um, were accepted as an observer in 2011. And for us, that's been like opening a door to better connecting with and better understanding cent uh, Central America. Um, we now go to the um, regular meetings of Central America, uh, of SICA, uh, which allows us to connect with the leaders and ministers who were there at the time, but also the other observer members of the organisation, which are all people who have an interest in better understanding and better engaging with Central America. It's assisted us to align our priorities and the way in which we engage with Central America with the priorities of Central American countries themselves, um, particularly when they've agreed to um, a regional strategy. So for instance, the Ambassador referred to the fact that there's now a Central American security strategy, which then assists us in working out how in our own um, niche way we can align our engagement with the priorities of the security strategy, as one example. Uh, we have, for instance, been to the summits, the SICA summits for the last three years. We've also uh, been to a number of the meetings of the group of friends, which are a high level officials meetings of Central American, uh, of, of SICA countries. And we've also been able to um, tailor we have a modest aid program um, designed to support engagement with Central America and we've been able to target and align that aid program um, to reflect the priorities of Central America where we think that we have something that um, could be mutually beneficial to offer. So for instance we've seen um, this work is focused on some initiatives uh, focusing around citizen security which is a priority of SICA. We've also focused on building capacity for dis post-disaster reconstruction and on 
supporting education through offering scholarships uh, for people from Central America to come to Australia. Um, Australia has supported the humanitarian needs of the region through funds for emergency relief activities in the wake of um, destructive storms and hurricanes. And Australia has also been funding some very small grassroots projects throughout different countries, um, including, for instance, in El Salvador, uh, we've been funding little programs that um, help improve food security and sanitation in El Salvador. Um, I think there's been some notable outcomes from Australia's assistance over the last few years. Um, it's a program of about $22.5 million for Central American countries over a four-year period. It started in about 2010. And so in that time we've seen um, 37 scholarships awarded to um, the Central American countries. Um, these have been focused on supporting um, people from the countries across the region in improving their skills in international trade and law, environmental management, water resources management, uh, governance and public policy, and also international development economics. We've, um, Australian aid activities have also supported linking the Australian public sector, public sector organisations with government agencies in Central American countries um, to build capacity through strengthening people-to-people -people linkages and the transfer of technical knowledge. So for one example of this has been the Australian Federal Police hosted a, a narcotics and transnational organised crime workshop symposium in Panama last year, uh, which involved representatives from most of the seeker countries. And it was focused on identifying regional threats, trends and collaborative opportunities um, for um, amongst law enforcement representatives. Uh, another program which has been um, yielding some positive results has been a, a training program which has to date trained about 1,200 young people in El Salvador, Honduras and Guatemala. Uh, it's, it's aimed at improving their access to employment and education. It's part of a program which is about the prevention of youth violence in Central America. It has successfully engaged over 100 regional, national and local political leaders. It has exposed over 500 young people to relevant jobs and skills, and uh, job skills. And it has, this program has worked with school leaders to prepare a good practice guide for preventing violence in schools. I think a challenge for the Central American region is, of course, that um, it's in a zone which is very vulnerable to natural disasters. So, um, and these are reflected, they take the form of things like tropical storms, volcanoes, floods, hurricanes and earthquakes across the region. Um, during 2011, natural disasters uh, caused losses of nearly $2 billion in Central America. And a, and over 100 people lost their lives due to natural disasters that year. So in that context, Australia's humanitarian assistance has focused on supporting Central American countries on the issue of pre-positioning of food and funding to support the extended relief of people and communities. It's also supported increasing seekers' capacity for planning and management of natural disasters and on improving the disaster response and preparedness across the region. And also, um, Australia has engaged with um, Central American governments and the private sector to boost local capacity in, for example, issues such as sustainable mining, water management, food security and governance. I know from colleagues here um, in Canberra that uh, they were very pleased with the uh, work on the sustainable mining initiative involving Central American company, uh, countries. So I think, um, oh, and just, I have a, um, a few of our colleagues are here from the um, AusAid as well. So if people have any questions about the type of work that's been going on in Central America on aid, then um, we can of course um, put you in contact with colleagues here. I think looking forward, uh, we've seen over the last few years, we've seen an expansion in our relations with Central America. Um, 
we would now see, I suppose, this is being more in a consolidation phase as we settle into uh, being an observer on Sika, uh, refining how we can engage with Sika and also continue our bilateral relations with countries in the region. Uh, we're very committed to continuing our engagement with Sika. Uh, as um, Ambassador Gutierrez has noticed, it's been making some significant progress. And over the last few years, we've noticed that we have not been the only country that's sought to be an observer of Sika. There's been quite an expansion in the observership of Sika. And uh, we look forward to continuing that relationship. Thank you. Thank you.